often I'll ask myself, well, how am I going to do this? <laughs> you know, or I, you know, I, I know I can do this. I told them I'm going to do it. But, you know, when you're actually working on it, it's like, all right, I need to figure this out. Like, but, and, and that's part of the fun of it too, like the problem solving and, and kind of, you know, pulling from your background and trying different things on it. Because, you know, once it does work, it's very satisfying. Although I had seen his work, I hadn't been introduced to Josh Johnson personally when we did this interview. On the VFX meets MoGraph side, you may be familiar with his work with designer David Lewandowski, but he's also built a thriving career working on some highly respected independent films, which we'll talk about. Remarkably, he doesn't live in California or even in a major market city, and we get into what set of skills and tools has allowed him to do that. Hey, this is Mark. Christensen, and I'm talking with Josh Johnson. Hi, Josh. Hello, Mark. How you doing? <laughs> Good. So um, we are going to talk about stuff related to the VFX business, and I'm looking forward to it. So let's let's dive right in. You too. <laughs> so we're we're starting from the beginning here with mm -hmm. uh, you uh, coming out of school with uh, no VFX training. That is correct. And then uh, evidently developing some skills. So uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what's your, what's your, this is like the, the question you get asked by your uncle over cocktails at some, <laughs> you know, family get together. Like, oh, are you, did you go to school for that? So <laughs> right. tell us, tell us about it. Tell us about that in your case. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I went to school um, kind of like for, at the time it was like video production I mean, they were trying to be like a film program, which they are now more robust. But basically, in my degree, um, you know, I learned like editing, some cinematography, three point lighting, a lot of yeah. the basic stuff, I guess, that would, would go into like basic video production or even like ground level kind of like film. Yeah. Um, so that's what I went to school with, you know, with the idea of I want to be a filmmaker, I want to be a director, cinematography right. I love as well, like that kind of thing, um, yeah. which I do love those things. And I'm still doing those things as well. <laughs> now like today but while i was at school i was like well everybody wants to do this <laughs> right and yeah. it's already hard to break into the field so probably like my last year there i was like well i think i kind of like computer animation i mean i've always liked computer animation uh, mm -hmm. in fact there is this show on discovery channel called movie magic yeah right yeah and that like when i was a kid <laughs> watching that i was like whoa this is awesome like people do that for a living like this is amazing and of course like many visual effects artists, probably my age, could speak to Jurassic Park when they saw that in the theater. Yeah, sure, <laughs> you know, as a sure. Kid, I was like, whoa, like how'd they do that? It's amazing. Right. So while I was at school, I kind of, you know, kind of realized that everybody wanted to do this. It's going to be hard to kind of break into the field. Mm -hmm. um, however, I graduated and I did land a job right out of college, kind of within my degree, which was video production. So I uh, was making training videos for GM. Mm -hmm. Just exactly what you dreamed of. <laughs> exactly exactly yeah yeah, yeah. so so it's the uh, dream realized so yeah done. right yeah but it was great because it really pushed me into another direction so while i was there i worked there for a year and i was yeah. doing everything like shooting uh, lighting sound editing uh, right. motion graphic type stuff but while i was there i was like, okay this is not what i want to do <laughs> that was <laughs> that was pretty obvious to me after a few months sure um, but i took advantage of what was in front of me um as far as like I had a salary, <laughs> so I was getting money. Um, and while I did that, I was still living at home. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to buy a computer. I'm going to buy my own um, camera, which at the time was a Panasonic DVX 100B, which right. was, you know, one of the really, really nice video camcorders that did 24P. Um, so I bought those um, with the uh, intention of teaching myself visual effects um, while I was working at this job. And they also did have After Effects there too, which they wanted me to learn. Um, right. Primarily for like motion design, motion graphic stuff. Yeah. For these wonderful GM training videos. Mm -hmm. So I did that. Um, and they also had a copy of Lightwave. <laughs> oh, okay. Which was kind of interesting. But yeah, but I started with After Effects first. Lightwave was good times. <laughs> yeah. So, and then um, and he had Lightwave. He was like, oh yeah, give, give it a shot. I was like, okay. So I, you know, played around with that as well. I was like, whoa, this is weird. It's like two different interfaces for animation and modeling. It was just, it was, or not even interfaces, it was like programs that were like built in. Yeah, ones. it was really paradigms, weird. different yeah. paradigms. <laughs> yep. Yeah, right. So that was kind of strange. Um, and that's why I did a, a little bit deeper dive and I found Cinema 4D um, with After Effects Connection even at that time. But right. while I was working at this job, uh, you know, I would, I would get off work and 
go home and spend like three hours probably every day, sometimes more, just going crazy, teaching myself, um, teaching myself After Effects, shooting my own footage, playing around with different ideas. And that's, that's essentially how, how I learned visual effects in, in the beginning. So what you're describing sounds like it's still a pretty legit way in. I mean, it's funny to think that, you know, you come out of school, you land. I mean, you really got a blessing there because you got an actual job. <laughs> right. Right. And and I mean, to be honest, the fact that it was with a recognized brand is is also great, even if it's like, you know, how how dumb the job is, but. And then the dumbness of the job gives you all this energy to come out, you know, on your own time and, and build upon it. So, uh, I mean, I, I've, I've been on both sides of this one and, uh, it's always really fun to interview somebody who comes from that background because the, the palpable hunger is just so, uh, <laughs> yep. you know, like it's a really, it's, it's actually a really great story to bring into basically any studio at any level. Like, yeah, I, I think so. I think like, um, you know, like skill, of course, and there's some natural elements maybe to different talents and things like that. But right. I think number one is like that passion and drive. And, right. You know, kind of the, the feeling that, well, everyone else is going to do this. So I need to work that much harder, like every yeah. day until I'm closer to where I need to be. And that's, that's truly how it was for me. <laughs> so that that actually that actually points us toward the next question I have here, which is um, the chicken and egg problem about breaking into visual effects so you've already kind of hinted at how one would do that um so it's it's almost like the next step in the story here so go ahead with that yeah so so again so i was at this gm job kind of teaching myself uh then after a year i was like okay i'm ready to leave (laughs) and but during that time i still wasn't sure what i was going to do exactly Mm -hmm. um so uh while i was still at this job i used um uh, forums, which are kind of not a thing too much on the internet nowadays, right? But but forums were huge for me, so I yeah. go to different forums and post a bunch of my work, knowing that other professionals, like with ten years plus experience, are on these forums and like they're sure. really happy to give free advice. <laughs> what, was this like the Creative Cow heyday? Yeah, like like Creative Cow, um, uh, CG Talk. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a, a Cinema 4D specific forum called C4D Cafe, which they're still right. around. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but yeah, back then, uh, those were, it was a big reason of uh, how I became how I am today because of the fact I could post stuff online and get this amazing feedback. Um, right. And that also got landed me my first bigger job. So I would, again, just post stuff online. And one mm-hmm. time I got this uh, private message on a forum that was like, hey, Josh, um, are you in LA? I have some work. That would um that I'd love to send you, or I mean, you could probably do something like that. Yeah. So I replied, I was like, oh, unfortunately, nope, I am not in LA. Um, in St. Louis, and he was like, oh, okay, well, if you're ever in LA, look me up. I'll, I'll definitely keep you busy. I was like, hmm, okay. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> wow. interesting. That's awesome. Yeah, that's encouraging. So that that was encouraging, exactly. So then maybe three weeks later, two to three weeks, uh, probably about three weeks, uh, I got the same uh, or I got a message again from the same guy, same company, and he was like, uh. It's like, well, actually, I think I have something I can mail to you that you can work uh-huh. on from like where you're at. I was like, mail to okay. you. I love it. That's so, <laughs> yeah. that's so 15 years ago. Exactly. Exactly. It was, it was one of those things like the footage yeah. was, was too much. They couldn't even upload it. <laughs> yeah. Right. So um, sure enough, he uh, packed up a hard drive, mailed it to me. And it just happened to be for this movie um, that was had around like a $50 million budget called Duplicity. I had like uh-huh. Julia Roberts and Clive Owen yeah. in it. Wow. Um, and uh, so I, I only worked on, I think, four or five shots. I just did 3D tracking. That's all I did. Yeah. And but that kind of, uh, you know, uh, it, was, it was tough. But after I finished that, I was like, okay. I was like, you know what? Well, yeah, I can do this. Right. And boom, you've got an IMDB page at that point. And right, well, you're, right. off, you're on your way. Yeah. And I was like, not only can I do this, maybe I can do this remotely, <laughs> kind of. Like not have to even move to LA, maybe. So I got to ask you, where are you right now? I don't even know. Yeah, I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. You are in St. Louis, Missouri. Yep. 
Yep. That's uh, wow. essentially where, where I grew up. Well, you're not the first I've met, but that yep. is that is some hardcore throwing down, actually. So <laughs> I'm very interested in that. <laughs> yeah. So it, it seems to me like you came up at just the earliest time you could have pulled that off. I, think I so. don't. Yep don't think it could have been pulled off much earlier than because we're talking no I, th- I think even five years before that it really wouldn't have been possible right like yeah so like we're talking like mid 2000s here right yep the mid knots yep. yeah yep exactly yeah we're talking like let's see i think i landed that duplicity job late 2008 right okay well i'm we're gonna we're gonna get back to this even though i don't think we have a specific question on my little list here but i'm definitely interested in that so um there's a question here about ways into the industry Mm -hmm. so i mean you just you just outlined a really Mm -hmm. a, a one that cannot be underestimated like going and working for a corporate video department and just being the one who's not willing to get stuck there. And, and actually forums were great for that too. I found yeah. because you, there are a lot of people with Joe jobs on forums. Like there's, you'd, you'd think like, Oh my God, the people who are really using this stuff must just all be badasses. Like, yeah, some of them, but some of them are just doing door, you know, they're, they're in some backwater doing like, you know, some, whatever they can get. Right. And, yeah. uh, you know, so, and yeah, so, so, but let's say that, um, Let's say you were just approaching a VFX company directly. What, yep. what I mean, if you, you know, what, what would you speculate as a good way in? Roto back in the day was, was yep. one of the entry levels along with match moving. Right, right. Yeah, I would say I think it depends on what you want to do or where do you see yourself in the future. So, yeah. for example, if you want to and see yourself hopefully working at a much bigger studio, um, mm-hmm. you know, ILM type, um, something like that, then yeah, I think really specializing is still something that makes a lot of sense for a bigger studio. Yep. Um, but at the same time, even if you are specializing, um, I would still say there's, there's lots of different skills you should pick up. So for example, if you are trying to break in roto and tracking makes a lot of sense, that's still kind of the, the, the bottom of the ladder where you would start (laughs) at a lot of the bigger studios. Right, and Roto corresponds a little bit more to comping and exactly. and motion tracking yep. more to 3D. Yeah, yep, exactly. Um, so I think those are still pretty good spots to start. But however, like even if that is kind of your plan to get in there, and I'm going to get really good at that, I would still highly recommend like really working on compositing as well because I feel like they're so connected yeah. um, to all those things, especially rotoscoping, as you mentioned, um, but even yeah. tracking as well. Yeah. Well, I think part of the question too was, I mean, Roto the the, the stereotype of Rota now is, yep. you know, get some company you've never heard of in, <laughs> right. somewhere in India to, exactly. to take exactly. care of it. But, yep. but uh, I think, you know, and I haven't been in a big VFX company for a while, but it it's still the case that yep. have some, having somebody right there that you can communicate with and also just turning something around on an as needed, like immediately and not farming it out is still pretty legit, you know, uh, a need definitely uh, for, for studios. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I think so. Definitely. And it's, it's a great way to start and kind of work your way up. I mean, I think it is definitely one more job that when the AI bots get good enough. Oh, oh for we, sure. That's going to be one be that's going to be gone. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> or at least <laughs> no one will miss it. <laughs> no. Well, no, maybe, no. maybe somebody who got really used to listening to podcasts all day. Like, <laughs> yeah, so right. Good. Right. Um, so yeah. I think that's a good way, but um, yeah, again, I think it kind of depends on what you want to do or you want to see yourself. And but again, like if if you really want to do lighting, then yeah, like yeah. by all means, work on that. <laughs> like make that your specialty. Then if that's what you plan on doing, um, to break right. in, because even if even if you um want to do lighting, I, I I wouldn't recommend like oh I want to be like that's what I want to do. I wouldn't just go work on rotoscoping and just start from the bottom mm-hmm. and work your way up. I would be working on lighting, um, looked of you know completely. That's a, that's what yeah, I not do. to mention just picking up a camera. Oh my gosh, yeah. So that's that's yeah. one of the biggest tips I give lots of different uh, artists and people in school and up and coming people. They're like, oh, oh, like what kind of advice do you have? It's like number one, be, get familiar with a camera. Actually, know how composition works within like holding a camera and what you see through the lens and f stops and you know mm-hmm. deep focus and shallow focus. What, what do all those things mean? Because I did have the advantage of knowing all that stuff before I started anything into compositing or, or the 3d world and that helps yeah. me a lot because all of those things translate lighting yeah um, yeah 
So that's, that's, I think, is, is a huge, definitely understand and know the techniques um, physically because <laughs> right. it all translates. And I, th- I feel like that makes you a much better artist knowing those things. Yeah. And do you feel like I do that? I think, I mean, in motion graphics, you know, it's fun that you can just always make your own rules and often you're right, encouraged right. to, you're, you're showing people the world in a way they haven't seen it. And visual effects does that to, to an extent as well, but mm-hmm. always also trying to keep people believing what they're seeing. Right. And, but, I, but I do run into in motion graphics points where I'm like, yeah, I really wish they had just looked at some reference and gotten that right. You know, if it's a, you know, a, a bit of bokeh or, mm-hmm. or lack of same, you know, a defocus that just doesn't look like a defocus. And I mean, a, a beautiful defocus is so amazing looking. Yep. <laughs> no, no, right. yeah, well, I we... think you're definitely right. I think a lot of those skills also apply to motion design. And I think even yeah. more so than now with the way that how video is so dominant nowadays. And yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost everywhere you look. Yeah, I mean, that's just a little heavy horse. I, I like to ride around. So <laughs> <laughs> thanks for indulging me in that one. Yeah. Um, but actually, that does segue into kind of our next set of questions here. So motion graphics versus VFX. I mean, I, there's so many ways to ask this, but is is there a versus in your in your experience? Like, are they two distinct things? I think I think they're different, but there's also a line where they also both merge as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, I think like when you think of MoGraph, like I often think like um, motion design or just uh, you know designing, like designers mm-hmm. is kind of the first thing that pops in my head, and right. I think that that is true. Like, um, I think a design background makes a lot of sense, um, but that's also not to say that a design background is not going to help you in visual effects. That's going to help you there too, of course, because you're going to learn yeah. a lot of the fundamental things, composition and color and different things like that. They're they're going to help them in both worlds, really. Right. So I, I think there is some differences, but I, I feel like um, they get closer and closer every year, <laughs> becoming, it's interesting. becoming very similar things. Um, just because uh, I feel like uh, with the fact that we do have carry phones around us, you know, everywhere and videos are everywhere and that's not going away. Um, yeah. And I feel like a lot of how you integrate motion design um, into videos is probably going to be some part of compositing or visual effects that's going to help that, um, you know, come sure. together and you know, make it uh, the best you want it to be and also like clients and stuff like that. So, yeah. Do you ever find there's kind of a, a, a difference in mindset between... Um, At least for me, I think there is. But I mean, yeah. it's probably different for some people. I mean, because I, I, some of your work is definitely stretching the boundaries of, of quote unquote realism. Right. And that is part and parcel what we would think of motion graphics doing. It's true. Yet, um, you're definitely doing it from a VFX point of view. And I, I just encountered, have always encountered a lot of people in the strictly visit VFX business who, you know, if you hand them a shot and go, hey, work your magic, right. they'll be like, what do you actually want me to do? Because they're... No, that, that's a good point. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, it's so used to getting a shot turnover that's got it all kind of spelled out yeah, and it, it's yeah, yeah. it's it's on the on the flip side i mean you know motion graphics is very technical but it's it's a little bit different flavor of technical than vfx yeah you know that's a good point it makes me kind of think of something that uh that is a little bit different i feel like if you're coming up in the motion graphics and motion design type of world i i, I do think you think about projects more from a director's standpoint than probably a lot of visual effects artists would oh huh um, now for me it was a little bit different just because i came from like a background of wanting to be a director and had like the, you know, video production slash kind of film school background. And, and I yeah. did do some motion graphics as well. So the way I always approach things is definitely from like a story perspective and a director perspective. I'm um, not yeah. just like you were saying like, Oh, here's my list of what I need to do. And honestly, right. that has helped me a lot. Um, Cause the reason I've been able to stay in St. Louis is because of word of mouth is how, you know, I, I could work. And uh, a lot of the directors I've worked with on, you know, whether it be feature films or commercials and stuff, um, a lot of them have spoke to my ability to to be able to communicate with them um, from a level of like storytelling and, and directing. Mm-hmm. And, and there'll be times where I even offer up ideas where I see fit. Um, so I think that uh, is, is also a, kind of what you what you kind of uh, touched on is a is a different way of probably thinking about a shot that some visual effects artists maybe wouldn't quite think that way just because of the way the industry has been and kind of like, Oh, here's your list here. Do this. Okay. Right. 
Right. Well, I mean, and on the flip side, mm -hmm. I've certainly worked with motion graphics artists who are amazing working with no brief whatsoever exactly. and almost prefer it. It's yeah, like, just, yeah, yeah. just let me make pretty stuff and, you know, <laughs> don't, don't bog me down with your, <laughs> right. with your realism constraints or <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's, I think it's actually mm -hmm. less that and more just habitual, honestly. But, um, but it, but that, that is a really great, that, that is actually a very valuable piece for motion graphics people who might feel a little intimidated, yep. you know, by the, the visual effects business and to, to realize that, um, having raw creative skills and and specifically the skill of taking you know making something from nothing like at whatever right. level you can do that that is that is a certain kind of magic and within within a visual effects facility the people who are either pure artists who can you know create um you know draw right uh, concepts or characters on, on that end of the scale or the pure technicians who can you know, create a visual that is those ones that are in the bounds almost of motion graphics, you know, the type of shit you do with Houdini, either on the right. MoGraph or VFX side. But yeah. even, even not going to that level, just cleverly coming up with something like, wow, that's really intriguing. Those are, those are really valuable skills. Definitely. I feel like one of the biggest things in visual effects, I, I would have to imagine um, for like uh, motion designers that are working on projects um, kind of at the same level that I would be, I think probably the biggest skill set is still probably problem solving is a huge mm. one. And I yeah. feel like that is probably what excites me a lot about the stuff I'm working on in the visual effects world, because literally no project is the same. It's like you're a, you get a new right. shot and you're like, okay, like how do I figure this one out? <laughs> like, you know, yeah. there's, there's not a tutorial to, you know, to right. go look up and figure this out. So um, do you often end up in a designer role? Um, like you are the, the designer or are you are you as often working with a designer uh I, it's gone both ways it depends uh -huh. i mean so there's a couple of situations where i've worked on like um, feature films um and i started from the very beginning so uh, you know i was brought in you know pretty much where you should be <laughs> during the script phase and being able to take a look and do a breakdown um so not only visual effects supervisor show which i've done a lot um but also um, work on some of the concept development for example there is a an indie feature in 2014 um, that I worked on that I did the concept design for the teleportation effects. Uh -huh. So it kind of, you know, I did, I did that um, as well as, you know, supervising it, <laughs> doing uh -huh. the bulk of the compositing work and a lot of 3d work. And I actually did end up doing all of the effects simulation stuff for the teleportation stuff as well. Um, yeah. But, but I did work on like the design for it as well in the beginning. Uh -huh. And for me, like that's exciting and kind of helps me go through all the different, um, you know, cycles that it needs to go through and, and working with the director and DP, all the stuff at an early phase, um, I think is pretty, pretty valuable. Um, but I guess you're right though. I guess, I guess some people maybe haven't had the opportunity to kind of, or, or, or maybe in a visual effects, um, coming from that background, maybe you don't even think like that's something you're going to be doing. So you're kind of mm -hmm. intimidated by it possibly, but yeah, I mean, I, I think you should, you should definitely be open to that design part of it as well. Like that you know, yeah. should be a part that excites you, I think. Right, right. So it sounds like you, you're pretty comfortable in both roles. Like, Fair, Yeah, I mean, fairly comfortable. I mean, I'm certainly not, like I would, like I, I've never called myself a motion designer by any, any chance, uh -huh. by any stretch of the imagination. Um, yeah. But when it comes to the visual effects world, I can definitely help um, design right. in that way. And, and, and right. technically there's, there's certain things that would, you would probably think, oh, that's, that sounds like a, that's pretty much motion design, <laughs> but well, there's what we call in visual effects look design. Yeah, and that right. so like your transporter effect would be an example of that, where it's like, well, yeah, just looked up. Yeah, you know, here's a little bit of information, but mostly, mm -hmm. and then they tend to cite references and go, okay, let's avoid making it like this or this, and but more like this. Yeah. <laughs> right, and there, you know, there's always the thing too, like the director. It's like, well, I can't really describe it. I can see it in my head. <laughs> Do they give you a couple things and then? Which is fine. Like, that's kind of fun, too. Like, all right, take this. Speaking of which, David Lewandowski. Mm -hmm. yep, yep. <laughs> this is a man who sees some crazy things in his head. Absolutely. Yeah. So tell me about that partnership. Um, that's that's someone I, I think most people listening are 
pretty familiar. And if not, they should yeah. be just Googling that right now and then Absolutely. seeing what they cannot then unsee. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> that, so David, it sounds like, you know, the style, the signature style is his and, yep. but you've, you've done quite a bit of work kind of building out the, the basic thing that he does into, I don't know, things with rolling subways and <laughs> crazy <laughs> right. shit. Yeah, yeah, no, no he's, he's a... He's definitely a unicorn. <laughs> he, has, he has lots of different uh, talents and so many different abilities. It's, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's interesting too, actually, to, to think, yeah, to, like, it's funny. It kind of reminds me a little bit of what Picasso said about his artwork. Like he, he had to learn to draw like an angel before he could learn to draw like a child or something. It's <laughs> like, there's something about doing something that's deliberately a little bit crude and wrong, but yep. doing it in such a sophisticated way. It's <laughs> just kind of mind boggling. Yeah, it's great. It's great analogy. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Yeah. But no, he, he's been great to work with. Yeah. Yeah. No, tell me more about it. I mean, yeah. so like I'm, I think in my experience, the people who do some of the craziest stuff are actually some often the easiest to communicate. Like they're yeah, the, yeah. The, the, the craziest artists often are very look you in the eye and down to earth about actually ta and, and able to talk about process. Ironically, is that the case? That's definitely David. Yeah. Yeah. Like he, he often like knows what he wants and, and because of, I guess his background and the artist that he is, he can imagine that in his head, but he can also, describe it to you pretty well or even make up a mock-up of something <laughs> yeah and and that's that's really helpful because that's not always the case um but yeah but i, I think he has a, a pretty extreme ability in the motion design world and the visual effects world and just and and, and then also being able to communicate that um to others right right uh, so I've, uh, i think i've worked with him on a, maybe like two or three music videos and then his um not let's see going to a store was the first one i didn't work on that but i worked on it late for meeting and then time for sushi like his mm -hmm. <laughs> his two follow-ups to that um, yeah i did a variety of things on those i think like 3d tracking and then um so compositing help and then fluid simulation things um but each of those projects like he was you know he knew exactly like what he was going for and he had the idea and it said right I have to say the the gag where the subway car lands in the station was really oh, funny. I actually yeah. laughed out loud on that moment. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So obviously, you know, there's a guy who you know is a master of these couple domains. Yep. So okay, unicorn. Um, and you know, similar. I mean, there's other people who could we could name people who are both you know putting out a very yeah, yeah. unique signature vision like you always know whose mm -hmm. work you're looking at well always i mean generally yeah <laughs> if, if you know you if you know the stuff you recognize it and so it, it seems like um it's a real encouragement to um develop that kind of i mean because it's it's founded on on technical skill right yep. like yeah. that's and that i mean the the question we we have down here to discuss is is how rare is that but i but i but i'm also interested in like you know it seems like there's always room for um someone to to go ahead and just do that and then you get the advantage of being approached for that yeah or or for something that's in that realm yeah if you're gonna take clients i i think so i think there is certainly an, always an advantage for that um and then as far as like how rare is that? I mean, it's hard to say. I don't know, but I've definitely have met people like David <laughs> and people and others that do seem to, you know, be um, really, really skilled in, in both areas. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, at the same time, yeah, I, I think if you're someone up and coming, or you're you're learning motion design, or you're already a pretty good motion designer, um, I think stretching those technical abilities and learning some visual effects thing is only going to help you. Um, yeah, that much more, even if you just plan to stay like in the quote unquote motion or the MoGraph world. Right. Um, like that's only going to help you so much. And that's kind of like the same, same things I tell visual effects people as well. Like for me, I came up as a generalist and that's definitely what I am. Mm -hmm. um, started with compositing, uh, doing that more first, which I still do a ton of probably the yeah. most, still the most I do. Um, right. 
But learning all those other different skills has only helped me to not only just communicate with other artists better, directors, uh, and then just help me as an artist better. Because if I am a compositor, but I'm also able to open up a 3D program, I can you know create some of my own assets for me if I need to, sure, to help this sure. comp go better, even if it wasn't necessarily calling for that. But if I know how to do that, then why not? Yes. Um, in fact, um, so that uh, the uh, one and two, which is the name of the movie, where I helped with um, the teleportation design, um, you know, the look dev of that. Um, so originally on that movie, we were uh, I was going to partner up with uh, Tippet, yeah, studio, and we were going to do the effects kind of together. Like I was going to supervise it, and then they were going to kind of help in post, and I was going to partner up with one of their more like. Uh, you know, senior supervisors, just so I could, as a consultant, so I could also bounce things off of, because it was like my first big project I was going to be supervising, like on set. Yeah, I may uh, know so the was, person you're talking about. I know a few people over there. Oh, cool. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, actually, it was Eric Levin. I don't know if you know him. Oh, yeah. They're, okay. they're my neighbors over in Berkeley, and there's That's a lot, awesome. of, a lot yeah. of ex-Lucas people over there. That's cool. Yeah. Super yeah. nice guy, just really, yeah. really talented. And it was, right. it was great to us. I got a chance to kind of work with him in the beginning stages, we actually worked together kind of developing um, the concept design of the teleportation stuff. Like I would, I would basically work on it and kind of send it to him. We'd go back and forth and then we'd present it to the director. Yeah. Um, so it was a really nice process. But the thing that I, I was going to point out was at first, like as we were working on that, like the idea was kind of stay all within this 2D realm, you know, just figuring out compositing wise. Mm -hmm. But because I had a background in 3D as well, I was like, well, to me, it makes sense. I need some effect simulation stuff to really pull this off. And yeah. I can do that myself. Like it's not uh, crazy to think this compositor can get in the 3D program and make some way on assets. So I did that. And Eric was like, oh, yep. I just remember him being kind of surprised a little bit. But I, but I think that's probably just um, like for me, it was no big deal just because I'm a generalist and that's kind of what I do. <laughs> yeah. um, but I think coming from a background where usually the compositor is strictly is doing a lot sure. of compositing stuff and waiting for other departments to hand you you know those assets yeah yeah exactly the assembly the assembly line thing doesn't doesn't occur i mean it, it's now be it's now a given in sure. motion graphics that you're gonna well for the most part you're gonna be using ae and c4d yep i yep. mean like it, you're, it's it's gonna be hard to be one or the other uh and call yourself a motion graphics person i think these days that's that's pretty unanimous that yeah that so i think that's that's a huge skill set i think is to yeah. be able to expand on that and, and even the technical side as well. I think it's worth reinforcing too. And I, I, I imagine you yourself fit into this as well, that it's possible to have a, a very signature style um, without being Beeple or um, David. I mean, they, there are, I've worked with some very gifted MoGraph slash VFX artists whose, whose style I recognize. And it just happens that their tastes go more toward you know like like one one guy like his favorite movie is the cell so he just likes super clean like hyper you know sexy type stuff and it happens to be exactly what clients want as well so that's <laughs> that's very handy for him but uh um <laughs> anyway so i mean i'm just saying it kind of as an aside like you don't need to have the idea that you have to be creating quite such uh, out there artwork, although sure. definitely visionary stuff will definitely get people's attention. Yeah, yeah. And I've come across a couple of people too that I feel like they started in visual effects, but have completely like, are in like the complete MoGraph world now. Oh yeah, like anyone we would know? Yeah, yeah. Like, um, gosh, I'm so terrible at names, but super cool dude. Uh, Rich uh, Noseworthy, I think is how you pronounce his last name. Huh. Okay. Um, I'm not familiar. Recently did some training with uh, Tim Clapham, like Hello Lux, for some Redshift training. He did, yeah, uh -huh. which is uh, haven't haven't watched it, but I'm sure it's I'm sure it's really good. He's, he's oh, a great I artist, see. Great teacher. Yeah. Uh, oh, cool. He actually started kind of in the visual effects world, and is now pretty much all in motion design. He's I think he's a super talented artist, and, and again, I think that foundation knowledge of visual effects has only helped him. <laughs> yeah. And what he's doing now. Yeah, not to mention some of the work habits in VFX can yep. be really actually helpful. Yeah, people I've worked with who've made that transition tend to still think in terms of efficiency because the the VFX facility model mm -hmm. is always kind of focused on that. 
Yep, that's true. Um, by the way, I, there's we we're sort of sticking to the glamour side, but there's there's the tedious side of this as well. And I, I mean, it's true of visual effects and motion graphics; they both got their kind of repetitive tasks that you yep. have to do. Um, do you do you want to weigh in on whether those are more odious in VFX than MoGraph, or if if you know? Yeah, I can I can definitely speak from just things that I've done, you know, over the yeah. years. Um, so yeah, so there, so there might be like um, a show I was working on last year. We premiered at Sundance. It was a, a feature film, um, and some of the stuff in there was kind of more the visual effect shots. Where some things were kind of fun and interesting, like some digital birds, things like that. But on the other hand, there was a lot of cleanup stuff too. And which film was this? Uh, this was called The Long Dumb Road. Okay. Um, probably a couple actors in there you recognize. I saw a ghost story at ILM oh, actually, cool. and I really oh, did you really at ILM? Yeah. 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 The director was there showing it and it was great. Oh yeah. David, he, he's amazing. Yeah. Gosh, talk about another unicorn and a freak of nature. That dude. Wow. <laughs> wow. Anyway, I didn't want to get you off top. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you weren't talking about that film, but <laughs> I did do a little work on that too. Yeah. Um, but so the long dumb road, uh, uh, had a variety of stuff in there. And it's one of those type projects too, which happens all the time in the visual effects world. And I'm sure it's not too different. Um, and, and really all, all the different kind of design worlds, but um, I got originally hired to supervise it on set, which I did. Um, and then there was like maybe seven shots the film was going to have, right? Like that's kind of why I was supervising and why I was there. And of course, later in post, that seven shots ballooned to like 40 something, <laughs> mm -hmm. which happens. <laughs> yeah. Um, and part of that is, um, especially because there a lot of the films that I, I do work on are, um, you know, smaller films. They're not, it's not like Avengers. So a lot of the directors haven't, worked with visual effects that much or know too yeah. much of the capabilities. So, right. cause you know, a lot of people, I think, Oh, like dragons and game of Thrones. And sure. That's obviously some visual effects work happening there, but you know, there's so much you can do to help support a story. Um, and, and for basic cleanup stuff that still goes a long way to supporting a story. So, sure. you know, for example, just like changing out some signs, yeah, some signs, is, you know, kind of a simple thing that, but is, is can be, you know, pretty crucial to like a story point in a film. Yeah. Um, I mean, shoot, even the, the first project on duplicity, what I was tracking was this hallway shot in a hotel and they needed all anything I needed to do was track it so they could change the uh, room number, the room oh, number right. of, a, of a hotel room because, <laughs> oh, okay. you know, because they needed that for like the story point to, to make sense at work. Um, yeah. But so back to Long Dumb Road, there was some cleanup stuff I was doing also like on the talent's face, uh -huh. um, you know, like removing blemishes and things like that because camera was up close. Um, you know, removing camera reflection, like in a car hood, you know, again, like those oh, if yeah. audience sees that, that. I love jobs. Do you like those jobs? I think those are really fun, actually. Those are fun. Yeah, those are fun. I mean, I wouldn't like to only do those jobs, right. yeah. <laughs> but when they're mixed in, they are fun because it's, it's also satisfying to, to be able to like remove that. I'm like, oh, yep, it's gone and no one's going to know. And, and I just helped, you know, um, support the story in a way that so a viewer is not going to see it and then kind of like get um, thrown out of a, or kind of, you know, remove themselves from the element of like, oh, this is a movie now. Like I can see this camera here. This is being, you know, uh, it's being recorded. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, the, the idea that, uh, you know, the, re the, the viewer is not going to notice these things and kind of just stay within the story the whole time and nothing that's going to like pull them out of it. Cause a, an obvious camera reflection, you know, is probably something that could potentially kind of make the viewer, wait a second, you see that and then you start thinking about things. Um, yeah. So yeah, you right. just want the, the story to keep flowing. Yeah. Um, so there, there was a lot of stuff I did with that. Um, and there was even some stuff where I added like a digital breath, cold breath and stuff, which is, you know, a little different than cleanup. How did you guys do it? Did you do the cigarettes through the sock approach? Which, which, how did you get your elements for that? So, yeah, so that actually, so I started out, I was like, well, I can, I can just send this stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is going to take forever. And it's any yeah, film no. on budget and to get it, to get it realistic enough to where I want, like, you know, because right. there's, there's definitely good examples of bad versions of that. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. Um, the social network had some terrible. Oh, my God. Yeah. Exactly. That was the, the main one I think of. Yeah. So instead, I was like, OK, let me let me look around. And I've, I think it was uh, FX Elements. One of the stock sites. Yeah. Had some great cold breath stuff on there. Held it perfect. Yeah, it's usually done by sticking somebody behind some black muslin and they just smoke a cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> yep, exactly. Like, there's no other way. Like, that's a perfect way to do it. Yeah. 
So complicated. Yeah. Like you're probably not going to go into cold temperatures and try to reenact it. Um, yeah. But but it was perfect and it, it totally worked. And again, like a really small thing to kind of help sell of the environment and where they were at and stuff like that. Right. Um, so yeah, there's there's definitely jobs I have where they're, they're more cleanup stuff, certainly not as sexy as other projects and, and work. Um, yeah. But I mean, some of that stuff I do have on my show reel as well. Like, um, in fact, there is a documentary I worked on that won the grand jury prize at Sundance in 2014. What's that um, one? Called Rich Hill. And so, uh, and again, like documentaries aren't really known for visual effects, right? <laughs> I mean, to the uh, standard yeah. viewer, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I, I did uh, probably like over 20 shots for that. Um, but a lot of it was, for one, fixing camera artifacts. Kind of yeah. like the equivalent of um, fixing like a dust and stuff on a film. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like a red camera sometimes will have some artifacts you have to clean up. Yeah. So fixing that. And then there was a bunch of stuff because it was a doc and it won Sundance and then PBS bought it and showed it like on the independent lens as well. Yeah. They didn't want viewers like being able to pause the TV and seeing like addresses, right? For these real people. Oh, uh huh. But they also didn't want, like the directors didn't want it to be, oh, it's a blur of his stuff out because it kind of takes you out of the story and out of the film. So right. instead, I just made up like fake addresses and things like yeah. that. So there were some complicated shots where like, I think one of them is, is on my 2008 reel where uh, there's a kid like going through pieces of mail and letters on a table. Uh, so I just replaced it with fake addresses. Right. Um, but he's moving them around. So there's traffic yeah. mapping and things Motion like that. blur and stuff. Yeah. 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 And some different things like that um, I did. And gen- changing logos on hats, you know, for brands and things like that always happens. Yeah. And shirts, yeah. removing of logos like that. So yeah, there's, there's, a, there's always cleanup work happening, especially right. once I think a director realizes, um, like, oh, that's, you can do that. That's, that's something we can do. That's not like crazy expensive. Mm hmm. <laughs> opens up a lot more doors yeah 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 do you so are you more of an audio book and podcast guy or more of a music guy while you're working on stuff like that uh kind of all of the above <laughs> okay fair enough all right yeah like uh, i'll definitely listen to some podcasts but I'll, I'll definitely throw on some music as well sometimes i'll go completely silent as well too yeah 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 it can get it can get zen when you're doing some of these things yeah, yeah. all right let's talk about uh tools a little bit yep. so it sounds like you started in after effects and video editing software yep yeah it started it i think the first program probably was avid yeah oh okay then final cut right and then they wanted you to learn after effects and right. then you and and it sounds like Lightwave popped up its head at gm as well is that right yeah that was the first program i used and i remember yeah. following a tutorial to didn't last very long. It was so great. Was it like a Dan Ablin tutorial? Yep. Yep. Yeah. It sure was. Yeah. Yep. Wow. That's funny. Yeah. I, I always loved the Lightwave community. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> very, uh, very, very supportive. Passionate. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and always trying to get away with murder. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, so, um, yeah. And then obviously at some point people were asking you for Cinema 4D rather than Lightwave skills. So you did those. Yep. And I imagine the same thing happened with Nuke. I don't know if you, mm-hmm. do you have a seat of Nuke in your studio? I do. Yep, I do. Oh, you do? Okay. See so it a spring. Wow. Okay. Well. Yeah. So I bought it uh, um, actually while I was working on that um, that feature in 2014. Mm-hmm. There was just a lot of shots and a lot of CG stuff and comps were getting huge and After Effects and kind of things were slowing down a little bit. And then yeah. just the ability to, to really... Um, um, composite and incorporate CG elements. I mean, Nuke just really shines. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean the the three D exactly. side of it. Yeah, yeah. I, working with FBX and, and and all that. So so yeah, I have a I have a, a seed of Nuke and I use Nuke, but I still mm-hmm. use After Effects too, just because I've been using it for like over a decade. So I'm still fast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use it. So I use both. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's funny that. Um, I mean, I it's almost well. This is this is a rabbit hole, but uh, <laughs> you know, I do sometimes remind people that it Nuke isn't necessarily more powerful. It's right. it's often much more efficient. Exactly. Uh, I mean, it's really only designed around visual effects, and you would mm-hmm. not want to do MoGraph. Mo- gra- <laughs> you would no, not want to. I mean, animating no, type no. in Nuke, I can't even imagine. Oh my what gosh! That would look yeah. like. I remember, like, I think when I first <laughs> had Nuke, I remember playing around with like the type tool, and that that was it. Yeah. That was the last time that was it. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. Okay. 
put that away. Um, let's see. So, so and a strange thing, just to point out, program was <laughs> I actually learned After Effects before I learned Photoshop. Oh, yeah. Which to me is odd, but um, sometimes it happens, I guess. I mean, yeah, you're really not alone there. And I actually, uh, oh, gosh, I've, yeah, I've encountered no shortage of people who get good at After Effects and just drop Photoshop entirely. Um, <laughs> oh, well, like, yeah. it happens. <laughs> Well, okay, so I'll, well, let, let's, let's dig in a little bit more. So where exactly yep. do you find that After Effects is the wrong tool and Nuke is the right one? Yeah, I mean, probably the, the only times I've really like, okay, like I'm definitely just going to use Nuke for this mm -hmm. is when I had a, um, on a feature or potentially a, a higher end commercial or something where I did have a lot of CG stuff to um, incorporate in, for example, it's a film I worked on that I supervised as well. It's on HBO now. It's called Native Son. Yeah. It's like a remake of it again. Yeah. Uh, based on that novel. I, uh, there was a couple of shots where I had to make like a digital rat. Did you say a rat? Yeah, a rat. Okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So like for comp compositing it, like uh, I just knew for me, like I'm always um, able to get better results at a faster, you know, more efficiently kind of what you spoke to. When I'm compositing CG stuff, um, mm -hmm. heavy CG stuff in a photorealistic way inside of Nuke. And I guess in ways it's no, not too big of a surprise because that's literally what it was designed for. Yeah. Well, were you rendering multi-channel like EXRs and going that way? I was. Yes, 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 yes. Yeah, exactly. And uh, for sure, like <laughs> certainly yeah. when it comes to multi-channel EXRs, there's really almost no comparison um, with, with Nuke and After Effects. Yeah it's, yeah, it's almost as if that is right at the heart of, yeah, yeah right. right. Yep. Yeah, so that that is a, a definitely a huge plus if uh, you're going to be compositing multi multi channel EXRs for Nuke versus After Effects. Right, but similarly, also if you need to work real time with some sort of 3D environment, uh, yeah, I mean, does that come up as well? Like where? You... Yeah, definitely, and and I think for projection stuff too. Like, yeah, um, there's some shots where I've had to do projections and. Sure, like I've, I've done my projections just straight inside Cinema 4D, you know, using mm -hmm. the projection man tool set and things like that. Um, but, you know, there's to be able to handle that in compositing and to be able to switch stuff out compared to having to do it all in 3D um, yeah. or attempting it in a 2.5D space in After Effects. So Nuke definitely like being able to bring in a tracked camera um, and, you know, work in the full 3D environment and set up some cards and be able to project what you need to do, whether it be for cleanup or anything. Yeah, there's actually a shot um, in that Native Sun film that, uh, uh, again, I knew 100 percent I was going to be using Nuke for it. I knew there's a lot of projection work had to be done um, mm -hmm. where I made some renders in cinema, um, but then did all the compositing, including the projection stuff um, in a combination with Cinema 40 and Nuke. That's really interesting. There's there's a, a MoGraph uh, artist friend of mine who um, spent some time in L.A. as well. And yep. He refused to get good at Nuke because of actually the stigma and the downward pressure on wages slash respect, <laughs> which is like kind of a, I mean, and I, I understood actually. I mean, I, out, out here yep. in California, it is a little bit like Nuke is the, it's the, it's the rifle that gets handed to the Russian army and then picked up <laughs> by another soldier when one goes down, you know, like, <laughs> <Right>. uh, <laughs> but like, uh, so in other words, um, after effects in his mind was where he could be an artist. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, that's, that's going a bit far. I think I, it, it makes sense in that most of the places you're, you're, a, you're unusual because usually, uh, Nuke, I bet, I, I would guess that 80 to 90% of the Nuke seats are company Absolutely. licenses. And so you're talking about a facility that's got to have at least a dozen, but potentially a okay. hundred uh, plus compositors slash generalists working with it, right? Yep. So, I mean, it, it you know, it, part, I think part of part of this is just that it's it's it exists in a more of an assembly line world uh, yeah. often than after effects does but do you do you want to say anything else about that uh yeah I, another thing for me uh, one of the advantages i'd say over after effects is because of the node base 
pro, um, the layout, the way it works as a compostable layers, it's much easier to um, try out something in a really big comp. Yeah. You have a lot of things going on, a lot of different nodes. You can literally just like switch out a node very easily and try right. something and you don't break your comp. Now, you can do that in After Effects. It just takes a lot more time to do that. Um, yeah. Or if you're working on a series of shots where like what you need to do is actually pretty similar for each shot. There's just yeah, a little exactly. bit of changing things. You can set up almost a template at Nuke yeah. and save it. And then, you know, save it a new version and then just change out one node with your new footage. And like, oh, I'm almost there already. And sure, you can like re-import footage into After Effects um, from a new, you know, change of the footage or whatever. Right. But it's just, uh, it's, it's a lot easier to um, iterate and, and change things like that inside a Nuke. Um, compared to After Effects, but at the same token, like because I'm so fast at After Effects, there's certain things like a lot of green screen car shots or blue screen. Yeah, like I'm just so much more comfortable inside of After Effects, uh -huh. just yeah. because I've been using it forever and I can get in and get out. Because uh, at the end of the day, it's about efficiency. So like whatever, yeah. whatever is going to make me go faster, probably is probably the tool I'm going to use. <laughs> yeah, and just to put that one to bed, I mean, there are, I I taught an After Effects uh, course at effects phd at one point so it was yep. full of a lot of nuke aspirants mm -hmm. and the attitude as we got into doing some is specifically the keying work was like well maybe i'll just take this over to nuke and stop messing <laughs> around with it and i'm like yeah it's not gonna be like that <laughs> it's like first <laughs> right. of all it's the same tool i mean key light exactly. is a foundry tool but also yeah a difficult key is just a difficult key, a difficult it's, key. Yeah. it's gonna <laughs> need some attention so it's really you're gonna have to put in the work somewhere Exactly. No, that's, that's exactly. Until, like I said, until the bots take over and the yeah, and the, exactly. until the, bots and the take depth over. sensing cameras have taken over where we don't use green. Oh my gosh, blue. yes. Yes, that is very, very <laughs> true. Um, but I will say, though, like After Effects, there is something about it that, and it maybe it's just because I've used it forever, but I, I do feel like there is a little bit, like something when you open it and you bring comp in or you're messing with something, there's almost feels like there is... Um, kind of more of a push toward like, oh, what? I can experiment a little bit more in here. Mm -hmm. Whereas Nuke... It does feel like you're just in a much more technical environment. And of course, you can experiment. It's a little programmatical. It's like, well, yeah, now yeah. I will introduce this loop procedure slash, yeah. <laughs> right. So in After Effects, I do think that um, there, are, there are certain things where you can kind of experiment yeah. quicker design-wise with certain things that, that it does still, I think, you know, obviously is, has the advantage of. Interesting. Even in the visual effects world for, for certain things. Like, I mean, you see like Stu how the, some of the stuff he does in After Effects and the way he talks and the way he uses it mm -hmm. is, um, you know, I think that kind of just shows like the, cause it, you know, it, it's a program that I, is, is fun to use. Like it's fun to use and it's, it's easy to, to kind of get started and to go, to go down that road and you can still, yeah. you know, still do really amazing, powerful things with it. I mean, Cinema 4D, similarly, I think more, yeah, uh, really absolutely. amazingly, I think more and more over time has become, I mean, Lightwave back in the day was kind of that way too, but I, mm -hmm. but cinema has got a lot of fun things that, uh, you know, and, and every, every cinema artist that I know is like, well, yeah, but one day I'm going to learn Houdini. It's like, well, okay. <laughs> but, and, and there, there is a technical limit to what you can do with, sure. you know, the MoGraph tools in, in cinema, but, uh, <laughs> you might you know it might not be as much fun i mean it might be a exactly. long learning curve and like uh... no i mean i think it's a much more it's much more artist friendly to, in my opinion um i mean obviously nuke or not nuke but uh, uh houdini is a lot more technical like there's just no way around that yeah that's and then it's a natural thing we do we always yeah you know you want to drive the maserati you want to like yeah and that that's one of the reasons i still love like doing look dev and even rendering when i can and shading and lighting and arnold uh-huh even though I know it's not, uh, it has GPU capabilities now. And I have a Redshift license, which I still use. Uh -huh. um, but Arnold, it's just, it's so fast. There's like so little controls, which is great. Because I feel like this makes it more artist friendly. Yeah. You get in and start playing around with look dev and fire up the IPR. Right. And that's just, that's just fun. Yeah. And it's a good, it's a good reminder. Um, I mean, it's kind of like when people talk about color correction or lighting and it's like, well, is it correct? And it's like, well, that's very mm -hmm. subjective, actually. And sure. it, yeah. it's it's really going to de depend on so many other factors that, you know, the glass, the 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 color depth of the sensor on the camera. I mean, they, and yeah. so, I mean, throwing Arnold on a on a render is is a similar thing. It's like, well, I don't know. It It's just now a lot of the things that were technically there without rendering it this way, just 
look better. <laughs> like, exactly. No. You could get into the nitty gritty of why, but yeah, for sure. And I think that uh, there's this quote um, I can't remember exactly, but Dennis Murin talked about like you know like oh like oh, technically you're supposed to do like the math and composite and you got to do this and this and this is what it says. But mm-hmm. he's like at the end of the day, it's all about the eye test, right? I I still think it is. <laughs> oh yeah, Dennis is he's really great for just messing something up to get it to actually <laughs> look right. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's see. As we get close to the end here, I guess we have, I, we can talk about some career retrospective type questions. Um, hardest, hardest VFX shot. Do you have a good war story? That's a, that's a, yeah, it's interesting. Um, I feel like almost every feature, like new feature I work on, like usually that kind of takes the cake. Like there's always a new shot <laughs> that happens to be the hardest one, it seems. Isn't that a great thing? That is a thing about visual effects is yeah. there is a sense in which every shot is a new shot. I mean, there are <laughs> there are yeah. the shots that are like, okay, we're, we're just, it's just a medium close up and we got to put them over background. But but any shot that's really got anything to it is is in many ways a new shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's one of those things. Like you know, often I'll ask myself, "Well, how am I going to do this?" Yeah, you know, or but you know, I, I know I can do this. I told them I'm going to do it. But you know, when you're actually working <laughs> on it, it's like, all right, I need to figure this out. Like, what do I? But and, and that's part of the fun of it too. Like the problem solving and and kind of yeah. you know pulling from your background, trying different things on it because you know once it does work, it's very satisfying. So is there a good example of one, maybe even fairly recently, where you actually had to learn something to get the shot done? Yeah, sure, sure. So I, I honestly, so this the film that I spoke about um, called Native Son, mm-hmm. which is on HBO now. It's um, so that had a whole bunch of stuff in there. Um, so for starters, let's just go back to the beginning of it. Um, when I supervised it. Um, so we're talking about a film that A24 was like already like bought it, you know, on the script phase, like before we started shooting. Yeah. Um, and Oscar nominated DP was shooting it. Mm-hmm. So I was like, all right, it's going to be awesome. Like, um, you know, all these people behind it, it's going to be like the easiest set I've ever walked right, into gonna... as far as like things are going to be how they're supposed to be. Yeah. <laughs> <It> was, yeah. <laughs> and of course that's, I mean, that's just <laughs> optimistic thinking. It's never right. like that no matter what, but <laughs> Um, so I walked in and I was like, oh my gosh, like the worst blue screen I've ever seen in my life. Ah. Uh. like, oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. Okay. This is this. Um, so when, once that carried over to post, I was like, okay, let's figure this out. And of course, it just involved a lot of roto work, <laughs> mainly. Yeah. Um, so that, that was a challenge. But in the same, the same film, like it had a rat in there, right? And so I had to make fur and stuff. And I've never done fur for, um, I, I played around with it, of course, did some R&D things and post some stuff on Instagram. Of you know fur renders, I yeah. never had to do it for a job. Um, yeah, so that was a challenge in itself, like sure. making realistic rat fur on uh, indie film on a budget and all these different things, and yeah. lighting that that yeah. was tough. Um, but then the last shot of the film was probably the most challenging in ways. The one I had to do some projection stuff on, just because. So it was a locked off shot, and of course, when working with a Oscar nominated DP, a uh, Locked off shot, still going to look pretty amazing. He knows exactly what he's doing. Uh-huh. Um, yeah. But so this was a shot that wasn't even talked about um, during script or before we started shooting. But then I had a phone call with the director and he was like, all right, so this shot's kind of like the most important in the mo- movie. It's the last shot of the film. It's like 18 seconds long. Like there's this voiceover and just needs to feel like this and real heavenly. And all. I was like, OK, wow. Just not hearing about this <laughs> shot. <All right>. By <laughs> the way, <laughs> by the way, kind of a thing. Um, so it was a locked off shot, but they needed like a a slow dolly right into the yeah. shot as well. And this was like in a warehouse facing up through the roof. So you could oh, see the so sky. a lock off that had to turn into a dolly. Exactly. So, OK, lock off had to turn off with a dolly. Um, it was looking off into like a blown out sky that needed to be replaced and feel yeah. heavenly and right. all these different things. So that was really challenging because it was also like 18 seconds long. So it's a slow push into a yep. scene. Uh-huh. Yep. A slow push. So I knew how to do some camera projection and, and oh, yeah. you know, to get the real parallax for the push. But then I had to replace the sky. Then I um, had to add like atmospherics into the shot. And like there was just a whole bunch of things that I've, you know, never really done all together for one shot. Yeah. To make it kind of make it work. Wow. And like having the pressure of like, oh, this is like really, really important. And this is a huge voiceover that goes with it. <laughs> yeah. And that was predominantly a nuke shot. That was one where you yep. were, yeah. Yeah. I mean, nuke and cinema as far yeah. as composite. Yeah yeah yeah, nuke, yeah. 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 But nice, a nice heavy dose of cinema 40 as well. Okay. So 
being this all rounder who can do all this, all these different skills, um, we've we've talked a lot about the advantage of that and the doors that's open for you. And uh, it, it definitely, I would credit being able to spend your whole career in St. Louis with that, like the fact that you're a go to for men. I mean, the other way to do it is to be absolutely the best at let's say concept art, you know, then you could live on the North pole if you wanted to, and they'd still find you. But, uh, <laughs> uh, what, uh, I mean, what would you say? Cause I mean, obviously there, there are disadvantages as well. So yeah. like what, yeah. what stands out to you? Yeah. You were talking I about? would say, so the number one disadvantage, um, uh, potentially is, uh, the fact that you are a journalist. So sometimes you're like, Oh, there's a new program or a new technique. I need to learn that. Or should I learn that? Or I kind of want to learn that because, I like learning about all this stuff, which is how I became a journalist. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like, do you really need to learn Marvelous Designer right now? <laughs> <You know? laughs> or do you need to pick up Houdini? Like you can get kind of lost of trying to do too many things or learn too many new things. So usually like I try to limit myself to things that I think I see an immediate need for I could use in mm-hmm. my work. Yeah. Um, or, you know, like there's very, um, like it's very possible that, oh, I might need to learn how to make fur, make that look good. So there was a time where I learned how to do that. And, you know, it, it helped me <laughs> eventually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think there is a, like, you know, the whole, like, uh, master of none, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> good at many tools, but master of none kind of jack of all trade things is, is a potential, potential thing only in the, the realm of if you try to do like way too much, like, you know, when do you say no to trying to learn something new? I think is it's an interesting dilemma that probably I, I still always struggle with. Yeah. Um, and then the other part of that is maybe uh, if, yeah, if, if you truly do want to work at a big studio, which, you know, I've had some job opportunities before at some, some pretty big studios in LA and stuff, turn them down. Um, mm-hmm. Thinking about it now, maybe I would have done a few more months or I would have worked maybe like a, a three month, six month contract at those just for the learning experience and things like that would have been great. Yeah. Um, but if, if you're, I feel like I got lucky too, for just, you know, connections and working on this and that, because I feel like in a lot of times you may not have the opportunity to be able to be a specialist at a studio. If you, if you've just been a journalist your whole time. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I mean, you get to work on whole shots. You get to call a shot yeah. your own and that, that's pretty rare. Like most studios can't pull that off. They the boutique approach doesn't scale well and it relies a lot on the talent of the individual artists and those people become hard to find. It's 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 easier for the student the studio to find someone who's just really good at, you know, shading or whatever. So Yeah, yeah. Uh you know, and I so I guess um I mean, I suppose the disadvantage that you're speaking to is if you wanted to call yourself the best at exactly. X yeah. or Y. Yeah. Right. Grooming or something. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Other than that, I mean, honestly, to me, there's not that many disadvantages, um, in my opinion. Personally. Yeah. Um, I mean, shoot, there was even a pretty big studio that had offered me like a compositing job, right? Um, but knowing my background and having worked with them on some different things and seeing where work, they're like, oh, well, you know, after the compositing job's up, if you want, you could jump into like some doing some effects work or, you know, jump, jump into like a, a different um, skill set, really. So, so yeah, so that just speaks to, I think, the advantage of it as well. Right. <laughs> even, even at a bigger place, potentially. Yeah. Huh. All right. So on behalf of the students taking this course, um, so you you come out of of uh, VFX from MoGraph with some chops, some VFX chops, and how would you suggest to a MoGraph artist that they they sell that you know, on on a um, like I guess specifically, and th- this is kind of you know there is an art to this. Uh, how yeah, yeah. how do you show your work? Um, yeah, I mean, and your reel's up there, so I think we'll link to it, um, so you can speak directly. And I, I even saw you have a you. There's still a reel of yours up from a few years ago, I think 2014. Yeah. yeah. Um, like anything you think is going to be posted, kind of indefinitely, we you you're free to actually reference okay. it directly. But you know, like more more kind of advice for people in that position. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, it's an interesting one. Um, 
first thing I'll say is strangely that 2014 reel mm -hmm. was the first reel I ever put up. Online, oh, okay. <laughs> which is a really weird way to go about things. I don't necessarily recommend that. Um, but at the same time, I don't know, I guess I felt like I wasn't ready to put it out there until I was ready. <laughs> well, clearly you um, didn't need it. You weren't... And I didn't need it because I was getting work already and, and yeah. I worked, was working in an agency as well. So what did it do for you to get that up there? Yeah, that, I did a lot actually. Like to my surprise, it kind of blew up. Oh, okay. Um, like I, I don't know what it's like now, but in a Google search, if you type in like VFX reel, like my two reels are like in the top 10 there, which is uh, odd to me. <laughs> well, you got this great, VFX Daily is a great brand. So that's, <laughs> that's yeah, got to be helps. helping you. But I mean, yeah. obviously the work's got to back it up. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So that all helps. And then I clean out some blogs and pick up. I was like, oh, like top 10 compositing reel that was mixed in with like the mill and com like Game of Thrones. And I was like, okay, all right, I'll take yeah. it. Yeah. Well, it's true. You're, and you're out there more than many. Um, yeah. Yeah, you have more. Uh, that's, of a that's what I was going to speak to. I was going to speak to is like you know, like like put your work out there, and mm -hmm. yeah, if, if it's whether it be a case study or before after reel, I think those are both helpful if if done well. Like yeah, and, um, and and you, you can look look you can look around. I mean, there's really great. I mean, look at a uh, David Lewandowski. He's got some great process reels uh -huh. of some of the stuff he's done. Now, obviously, that's probably more in depth than than maybe what um, he'll be able to post after some of what you learned here, maybe. But it's a great. Um, it's a great uh, example of how to really put together, I think, a good process reel or before and after reel. And right. I think from like a motion designs perspective, I think a process reel is, is lends itself even better than just a before after reel, which is kind of a more visual effects reel, in my opinion, at least. Uh -huh. I feel like process reels are, are a little bit newer. Maybe, yeah. Maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. But like a process reel, because you could see like, oh, here's like the early design stuff I started working on and the footage I shot, and then some of the 3D I did, and then we composited some of the new visual effects stuff that I learned, say, in this class. Yeah. Um, so I think, like, a, a nice process reel or, or case study could speak to that, I think would, would be very beneficial uh -huh. to kind of showcasing what you what you learned. Yeah, definitely. Are there, are do you look at a lot of reels, or do you end up, do you hire, do you hire people um, to help you, or are you really mostly a lone gun? Uh, I've definitely hired some people, too. Um, so uh, I, I used to look a lot of real like a long time ago. I looked at a lot of them more for inspiration, honestly. Yeah. You know, when I was starting and things like that. Right. Um, but yeah, so if I'm going to hire somebody, sometimes I will look at the reels or usually it's like word of mouth recommendation from type of somebody. And then, then I'll check out the reel too. Yeah. Um, because on that, uh, that 2014 uh, film, that I did a bunch of work on the one and two one teleportation stuff and all that. I uh I think I comped like comped sixty percent of the shots, did a bunch of three D work, did all the teleportation stuff, but I did hire some freelancers too to help me for some compositing and some um three D work and some lighting on some stuff. Yeah. And you know, they were like super talented, you know, really uh -huh. amazing uh, yeah. freelancers. And of course, like their real spoke to that. Not okay. to mention like their IMDB and things like that. Yeah. Um so yeah, so I think I think reels are, are certainly important. What to, what would you say? What, what would be the biggest mistakes? Uh, and yeah. specifically, I mean, like, because I think, um, well, let's just talk about visual effects specifically. Like, what are the, some of the main mistakes? I think all reels probably the biggest mistake is length. <laughs> you yeah. don't want to go too long. That's that's number one. Yeah, I was. I knew you weren't going to say too short. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. I bet it's possible to do an amazing five second reel. That would get I you prob hired. Probably. Yeah, I bet it's possible. <laughs> you know, prob probably. Yeah. So like probably length. Um, and then for sure, like not having tutorial stuff that's recognizable that, Ooh. you know, is in your real. Right. Is that stuff we think we've probably all seen that before here and there? Yeah. Or I mean, if you are going to do that and this actually that speaks to how we design this class, the, you know, the idea is to put your own stamp on it. I mean, absolutely. In visual yeah, effects, yeah. we're all limited by the elements that were shot and kind of the, the sure. brief we were given. And yet, you know. No, and I think that's that's 100 percent true because, um, you know, I, I think a tutorial really showing you a lot of techniques and stuff but yeah but like you said you can still put your own stamp on that it's not just oh i followed every single step and made it exactly like this other guy made it or whoever yeah no that's like that's a common putting your own stamp on it and i would say like this day and age um like even just outside of this class um, even if you are following a tutorial i highly encourage you to shoot your own footage on your phone like there's almost no excuse nowadays we have 
cameras yeah. right on our phone that are pretty decent. Yeah. You know, like when I was starting, we didn't have that. I didn't have that on my cell phone. <laughs> right. I, I bought a camera. I didn't have DSLRs even. Right. You were talking about these hyped up DV cameras that you were working with back then. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, so, yeah. So I would encourage you to like shoot some of your own stuff and experiment, um, even with some tutorial knowledge and then applying that to like kind of your own shot design mm -hmm. is, is very beneficial. And, and honestly, that's how I lot how I taught myself a lot of the stuff that I know. Do you find the adage that your reel is only as good as the worst shot on it to be true? Like, do you think that if, if like whatever's the weakest shot on the reel becomes kind of like the red flag baseline for judging the work? I don't know. I guess I've never believed that, but I'm yeah. not sure. I... Well, like you're looking at a reel and you see a shot that's like, ooh, yeah, they didn't really quite nail that one. <laughs> yeah, no, to me, no, no. Like, I, I'm not going to judge the whole reel just oh, by okay. that shot, yeah. or the majority of it at least. To me, that's probably like, okay, maybe they don't fully understand about putting a reel together. Uh huh. Maybe ed okay, so you bit, give them a little bit more of a break. Interesting. I would. Because like, yeah. if, if, if I'm impressed with like 75% of it, we'll say. Sure. And then maybe 20% or 25% is kind of lacking. You're like, wait a second. That probably just means they didn't need to add that shot. Yeah, or exactly. That was an older shot, maybe, you know? Yeah, that's where the 45 second reel would have been just as good exactly. as the one minute exactly. one. At least I'll give the benefit of the doubt for something like that, at least in the beginning, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, any last thoughts? I feel like this has been a treasure trove of information here, and I really thank you for it. Oh, thanks. I hope, hopefully it's useful. <laughs> Do you have anything else you want to throw in before we sign off? One thing I, I will point out as far as like, um, like, don't limit yourself to, you know, which is, I guess, I think that's probably why you're, when someone's taking this class is because they really aren't limiting their self. They're learning this new tool set, visual effects to help their design work. But I just really want to, um, you know, emphasize that because I think that is so helpful. Um, and I'll just point to this movie that I did work on, the Native Sun one that I did a bunch of work on. There's actually um, a sequence where um, there's a lot of green screen driving stuff in there. Mm -hmm. But there's a sequence where... Um, uh, most of the plates um, for the the background plates for that were like bought, you know, stock wise. The film didn't have, I guess, the money and the time to like shoot their own background plates. Yeah. So we bought some stock stuff, but there is there's some stuff that just wasn't working, right? Like I didn't think it was that great, and the quality wasn't good enough. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually just had my own DSLR and uh, my little camera rig. Oh wow! Tiny little thing. Shot my shot like eighteen car plates um, myself just around St. Louis uh -huh. and. Uh use those instead and got that in the film. Um, but the reason I, I point that out is because it's like, it's, it's because, you know, I've, I've done, you know, camera stuff, cinematography things and learned about that and, and, you know, shot stuff like that just for fun. But also um, knowing that I could incorporate that into the work I was doing to elevate it to another level. Um, but, but I never even would have gone to that conclusion, right? If I hadn't done those things previously. Yeah. Like I never would have been like, oh, I can just shoot some of my own stuff, you know? Yeah, yeah. Especially like on a feature. It's like, oh, well, someone else has to do that, right? <laughs> well, and that can be tricky. So on a feature, yes. That yeah. Can be, that can be tricky as far as Well, like, but also, I mean, so so relevant questions here. Did you did you charge for the service? I did. Okay. Good. That's good. Because um, the more pro the person you talk to is, the more insistent they are. Like, yep, if you brought in your own equipment... Yep. Not to mention the time you spent on it, but you're probably already, exactly. you are billing for your time and you are saving yourself time by not having to work with shitty elements. But, <laughs> right. And, you know, polish the turd, as it were. But, uh, but yes, that's, that is, a, that is even, and, and it is tricky when you're also the one recommending it. Um, right, right. Lousy clients would probably s suspect you of trying to upsell them on, you know. That's true vacuum cleaner attachments or something but uh but that really came from a spot where like um looking like and review process myself and say director and other people right. weren't quite happy with something so i was like yeah and you had that trust exactly in that too and they and you're a known element actually i mean that in a facility sometimes you have to co cover your tracks on this stuff like if you're going to shoot a practical to stand in for what was expected yeah. to be a 3d sim Right. Um, you know, you may not want to share that as long as That's true. the client's happy with the result. Uh, yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, just cause uh, people, I don't know, like yep. people sometimes respect the wrong stuff or expect the wrong stuff or. No, that's true. And, and for something like that, like the end result is all that matters anyway. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, 
as as and in a way as always but uh <laughs> but it's cool that you've got a you, you enjoy the process too i think that comes through loud and clear so thanks for ch- talking about that <laughs> yeah, welcome. <laughs> yeah, awesome. This was great. Um, yeah, thanks so much. I think we're gonna have links. Uh, where Where do you like people to find you at at VFX Daily? Is that kind of your home? Uh, yeah, there's that. I mean, Twitter VFX Daily on uh-huh. Instagram. I'm Josh VFX. Oh, excellent. Cool. Thanks for chatting. Awesome. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, Mark. And uh, gotta say, uh, your book was the first one I bought when I started learning After Effects. Oh, I'm honored. So there you go. It's it's very, very helpful. All right, Josh. Talk to you later. I got to hand it to Josh. I've met others who've succeeded pretty independently, but he clearly has the gift of connecting with people who aren't in his geographic vicinity, working creatively with them. And let's face it, he's got the skills to pay the bills. So I haven't met anyone doing exactly what Josh does, but he definitely makes it feel possible to kind of do whatever you want, wherever you want. I hope you enjoyed it.